Now we are looking at the final session, which is session 13, and we're looking at research in urban communities. And uh, this is an area that you want to pay particular attention to because it's not only useful for your urban sociology, it's going to be quite useful in terms of your ability to discuss approach to researching any particular research problem. Now, the sociologist carries out his research in a scientific format. This is basically what makes sociology a scientific uh, discipline. Now, exactly what we mean by uh, science. Science can be defined as any body of knowledge based on reliable observations acquired through systematic procedures and organized into a system of general propositions or laws. I remember that the definition says any body of knowledge. It could either be sociology or it could be uh, biology or chemistry or physics. It could be political science, it could be geography. Any body of knowledge, as long as it is based on reliable observations which would require through systematic procedures, it qualifies to be a science. This is how sociologists defend the scientificity of their discipline. And before be embarking on a research, you need to, to identify a problem. Without a problem, what are you researching? Uh, but the problem here is what constitutes a researchable problem or a social problem, if you like. We have attempted a definition of uh, social problems uh, earlier in our discussion. But it does refer to a negative phenomenon which has become so widespread that it is of concern to the majority of the people in the community to the extent that they call for something to be done about it. We identify armed robbery as a typical social problem in the sense that it is negative because it leads to the possible seizure of your legitimately acquired property. It is uh, widespread, we know that already, and of course, a lot of people are concerned about armed robbery and they're calling on the authorities to please try and do something about it. This is a typical social problem that we want to look at in this discussion. Now, when you have a problem, the very first thing you want to do as a beginning of the scientific method is to have a theory. Now, a theory is simply a general proposition which has the capacity of explaining and predicting behavior. There are other definitions which you will find in the detailed discussions that uh, we provided in the slides. Now, you are looking at armed robbery and you want to find out which theory could explain armed robbery and that is going to become your theoretical perspective. And what do you think yourself? What we, uh, we reference to the theory that we have discussed much earlier. Which of these theories do you think is applicable? I would suggest that the theory of anomie suggested by uh, Robert Merton would be applicable because he suggested that in every society you have two categories of significant things. You have this cultural structure which refers to the cultural goals or the things worth striving for. And then you have the social structure which refers to the legitimate means to achieve the cultural goals. This is the dichotomy between the goals and the means. And if anomy does occur in a situation where there is a disparity between the goals and the means, in the sense that some people in the society, by reason of the uh, position in the social structure, do not have easy access to the legitimate means, then we have a situation of anomy, and there will be all kinds of adaptation to the situation including conformists who obey the rules, they accept the goals, and they accept the legitimate means as well. Additionally, we have innovators, which are of quite uh, significant for us in this discussion because armed robbers are innovators. They innovate armed robbery as a means of achieving the cultural goals. They don't have access to the legitimate means, so they innovate illegal means of robbery. Those who smuggle 
smuggling is an innovation to acquire money illegally to be able to achieve the cultural goals. Now, what are those cultural goals? The things we're striving for, we can identify them as political power, salvation, if you want to go to heaven, you, you need some money. If you want to gain political power, you need a lot of money to organize your uh, uh, campaigns to be able to get elected. Salvation, going to church, you need to pay your tithes, you need to give offerings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you need it to become rich as well as one of the goals, to become wealthy, have material possessions, you want to build a house, you want to get a beautiful car, all of those are material possessions, which is getting rich or getting wealthy as one of the goals. Then you want to get married. Everyone, most people want to get married. Then you want to have higher education. And then, of course, you want to pay adequately for treatment so that you will be healthy. All of these are cultural goals, but they require, before you can achieve them, they require that you use legitimate money, money you acquire through salaries paid to you for having worked. That is legal money, which you can use to pay for your school fees, pay for your rent, etc. So we're saying that there's a situation in which some people, like the armed robbers, they don't have access to education, they have access to jobs, so how do they survive? Their survival is through armed robbery, seizing by force monies and other property from people who legitimately acquire those properties in order to enable them to survive. But it is an illegal adaptation. So that theory is capable of helping you develop a perspective on armed robbery. So we assume that you have a problem, which is armed robbery, and you have a theory, which is the uh, Robert Merton's theory of anomie. Now, the next stage basically is the logical deduction stage. Logical deduction requires that you should go into the field and talk to people. If you want to talk to people in the society, you want to find out from them what their view is on armed robbery. What do they think is the reason why we have armed robbers? And they will tell you their reasons. But the best bet is to go to talk to the armed robbers themselves. And where do you get them? You go to the prisons where they have been kept, where they're being kept locked up. So you have easy access to them and you have to select a very small, maybe about 20 of them. And you ask them, why did you get into armed robbery? And they probably tell you that I didn't have any job to do. So unemployment becomes a reason that you would have gotten as a basis for the formulation of hypothesis in the next stage. Another one, not maybe five of them tell you they were unemployed. Another four might tell you that they didn't have enough income from the job that they were doing. So they felt compelled to have to supplement their income through armed robbery. So inadequate income becomes another basis for the formulation of hypothesis. Others might tell you that they were compelled by their friends who are already into armed robbery. That is peer pressure which you want to investigate as well. And then others may tell you that uh, they were not properly educated or inadequate education, little or no education, which could be the reason why they did not have jobs in the first place, which led them to be unemployed, and therefore they went into armed robbery. So you get these reasons from your logical deduction, and the next stage is to formulate hypotheses now, hypotheses, they are critical in any research. They lie at the heart of the research because they determine the kind of questions you're going to be asking your respondents in the field. But what are hypotheses? A lot of students do not really understand what a hypothesis is, so they don't formulate them properly. A hypothesis definitionally refers to a general proposition which expresses a relationship between two variables. We have the dependent and independent variables. There must be, your hypothesis should be formulated in a way that suggests that there is a relationship between the two variables. For example, if you said, the higher the level of unemployment, 
the greater the predisposition to armed robbery, that would be a good hypothesis. You're saying that the higher the level of unemployment, the greater is the predisposition to get into armed robbery. So we assume that if you lower the level of unemployment, the level of the predisposition to armed robbery would equally lower because more people are not being employed, so lesser people would be predisposed to armed robbery. It's a clear relationship between those two variables. That is how you formulate hypotheses to ensure that uh, you can test them, to ensure that you can have access to asking questions which are based on the dependent and independent variables, namely high level of unemployment and high predisposition to armed robbery. Or the greater the peer pressure, the higher the predisposition to get into armed robbery as well. If your friends, a lot of your friends, or what your friend tells you most of the time is that armed robbery is good, you get a lot of money out of it, you're most likely to want to get into armed robbery. So there again, if the pressure is great, then your temptation to get into the action would equally be great. There's a relationship there. So this is how you formulate hypotheses to uh, ensure that they are testable and measurable based on the kind of questions you're going to be asking in the field. The next stage, now remember that we are proceeding systematically now. We had a research problem. We had a theory which served as a perspective. Then we went to the field to do what is called a pilot survey. That is the uh, logical deduction stage. We asked a number of armed robbers what were the reasons why they got into armed robbery. And then we came to the formulation of hypothesis. We are proceeding systematically. This is what makes any study scientific. The next stage is the definition of key concepts. Now, this is quite important because you do not want anyone reading your, uh, your work to misconstrue your findings. For example, if you say the lower the income, what exactly do you mean, the, you, the researcher? What do you mean by low income? If you define that, you may say, for example, that anyone earning be, uh, below 500 Ghana CDs is on a low income. If you do not define it the way you want it to be understood, any reader of your findings might place a wrong meaning or might get a wrong meaning from your findings because he's going to be defining low income as anyone who earns below 1,000 CDs. So you tell him exactly what you mean by the key concepts. What do you mean by armed robbery? What do you mean by unemployment? What do you mean by peer pressure? All of those key concepts should be defined so that you preempt the possibility that someone reading your work is not going to put the wrong conceptualizations to determine the validity of your work. After you're done with the definition of key concepts, you're kind of ready to come into the field. And this is where you are getting ready to go into the observation and collection of data. Now, but before you start the collection of data, there are a couple of things that you need to do. Firstly, who are you going to talk to? You have the armed robbers there. How many of them are you going to talk to? Uh, assuming that in the whole of Ghana we have about maybe 8,000 armed robbers in, in the prisons, are you going to be talking to all the 8,000? Maybe not. This is where you do something known as sampling. But your sample has to be representative of the total population. So according to the statistical rules, you may decide to take about 10% which means that you're going to take about 400 of the 8,000. And that 400, the information you're getting from them can be generalized to the entire population of 8,000 armed robbers. That is how you minimize and manage your research so that you can accommodate it in terms of the cost and the time you're going to be spending by dwelling on uh, steady samples which are representative of the total population. But there's one caveat there. You know?